Signs of the Southland, Sunday, February 13th, 2022. It is Super Bowl Sunday here in the United States of America, or as I am going to call it, given the content of our podcast today, Super Bowl Sunday. We will be previewing both of our bat and ball sport teams today. Mr. Grant, how are you doing this fine afternoon? This is probably the most sunburnt I've ever been doing one of these podcasts, but you know, that's a worthy sacrifice. Did you consider not going on vacation and skipping our podcast recording last weekend? No, I honestly, I did not. I I went on vacation and that was that. Wow. Very poor company man here. Yeah. Uh, It's, it's been a long couple of years at the FTRS content factory and uh, I just needed a break, you know? You know, everyone gets a vacation. Everyone deserves a vacation. Uh, speaking of which, both of our bat and ball sport teams have had a long, long vacation since we last saw them both last May. So yeah. you, you have something to you're going to ruin my segue with a comment here. No, I was just about to say it feels like it's been a lot more than what I, I think we saw. You said May for baseball. It may, maybe it was June. Feels like been longer than eight months but i think it's because in the season you see softball play 50 games you see baseball play 50 60 games like it's they're they're a date there we're about to enter the phase of the spring where sports are like super daily like like more than you know the, oh there's a volleyball game on a thursday and oh no it's no it's it's every every couple of days it's it feels like for me, it feels like that uh, one month stretch in 2017 where Atlanta United was playing a Sunday game, then a Wednesday game, then a Saturday game, a Sunday game, or then a Wednesday game or a Thursday game, and then another Saturday game. It was for like two or three weeks they were doing this as soon as Mercedes Benz opened uh, officially, which was fantastic for me. I got to go to I got to go to the stadium a lot, but <laughs> it's a brutal stretch. Yeah. <laughs> for that sport specifically. Uh, but, you know, it's a fun time for everyone involved. I think uh, much like how, you know, the world fell in love with volleyball this year or uh, the 2019 baseball team, just the fact that, and again, a little bit, a little bit less with volleyball because they only play twice a week, but in a way, one, because of smaller lineups, but uh, just in terms of frequency of hearing the same names and seeing the same faces, like, uh, a, a good baseball team, a good good volleyball or basketball team just feels very present in, in a way that I think something like football or maybe something a little bit less uh, per- personal. I, I don't know how I'd word this. It's but like, like depth, that's right? Swimming. It's like it's program depth. Yeah. It's program depth. It's, it's the meat of the sandwich here. Yes. And in a way like, oh, golf is never really on TV. We don't like – have that weird sporty bond with, with them. But I, I think you get where I'm saying. Point is, yeah. we're about to watch a lot of a, a lot of uh, stickball sports. So a lot should of be- stickball. So let's get started with the team that actually started playing this past weekend. And we didn't get a chance to preview them before they started. Uh, softball headed off by coach Eileen Morales, who I think is in her fifth year on the flats. They are now 4-0 after the buzz Classic, their fifth game versus Marshall, uh, which was scheduled for today at one, so about an hour ago, was canceled after a small incident Saturday night. I'm not really sure what happened there. There weren't many details. Hope everyone on the Marshall side is okay. Speaking of some of the teams that were at the Buzz Classic, in, including Marshall, they also played Villanova and St. Joseph's, so both a lot of Philly representation there uh, with Nova and St. Joseph's. And that's kind of how they start off the schedule, right? They play the Buzz Classic. They play another couple of tournaments here and there. I think one's in Penn State, the Battle of I-75. There's a couple more on the docket. In this early season slate, what stands out to you? Yeah. Um, I, I I was actually taking a gander at the schedule this morning to kind of to, to prep for things. Um, and, and it was kind of interesting because – if you think about it, if you look back at the rebirth of the Buzz Classic a couple of years ago, the big leading thing there was getting Washington in the building 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, the historic matchup, a great team, um, really testing ourselves. And, and to be fair, that was a, a gem of a game. Um, both, both, both they, of those were, um, but, uh, and, and of course this was before the Marshall news came out that I was doing this thought, but we don't see a power five team until, well, it, it would have been the 10th game of the season, but now it'll be the ninth, um, until the ninth game of the season. Right. Um, uh, which means that for all the, wow, there's, there's a lot of games early in the season. Cause there are playing, playing five games in a weekend is a lot. Um, you kind of have to expect to go into that Mississippi state game. Eight. No. Mm-hmm. And uh, with, and we'll talk about expectations to be it further down the, further down the shot sheet here, but I don't think that's unreasonable. I get it. It's baseball. It's softball. It's these sports where you play a massive volume of games. You're going to be in, you you can very well be in a position where you're Georgia tech and you lose that EKU game or whatever last year. Right. Mm -hmm. So made uh, the tournament as a comfortable number two seed. I don't think that's unreasonable to say at all, but that is also operating on a different level and a different caliber, I think. And, and, you know, you can correct me if I'm getting a little bit off track here, but Georgia Tech softball is not really in the position where they can be giving away gimmies, right? And softball Mm -hmm. is still, even though we've seen more non-seeded teams make a college softball World Series, I feel like the medium level and it just, it just isn't quite as, as there as some other sports, right? Like if you're going up against some of these top teams, Oklahoma, Florida state, UCLA, the teams who are going to take care of business really well, like you, you got to take care of business too. If Mm -hmm. you are a power five team that is going to be playing, like if you look at our slate, we're getting Duke, quality tournament team, Clemson, quality tournament team, FSU, quality tournament team, baking those nine games, even, and and then that's just for me, you know, taking a quick perusal of the schedule. If you're baking those nine games in already, you can't, you're, you know, you got to win some of them, obviously, but it it also becomes imperative not to lose some of these other ones. Mm -hmm. I I mean, this is the kind of schedule that we talk about in football that's built to make a bowl game, right? If your end goal is to make a bowl game, what do you got to do? You have eight conference games that you can't change. You can't get out of. So you work with the four non-conference games you have and you schedule reasonably. Yep. Appreciably. Right. Um, that, this is something that Kentucky, Kentucky does really well in football. This is sort of what the model looks like for softball this year a lot of those non-conference games are on paper very winnable mid low major opponents right uh against mid and low major opponents that are wins that you need to bank in order to have a competitive at least a competitive looking record heading yep. into tournament decision time tournament selection time um the acc schedule is the acc schedule and i think it, it's Honestly, kind of brutal. Um, they'll open with Duke, uh, we talked about a little bit earlier. Then they get this really nasty stretch in mid-March where they play an FSU series at home, then clean old-fashioned hate all away, um, and then Louisville away in the span of like two, two and a half weeks. Then they come back. They There's a couple midweekers in there. Then they'll get NC State at home in mid-April, comes in away in late April. It's the ACC stuff is tough. And you sort of knew that coming in, especially with the growth of the ACC with Clemson and Duke coming in hot as new programs and and the growth of the ACC is a softball conference. You kind of knew that the conference schedule was going to be tough. So making the non-conference schedule as manageable as possible on paper, again, all of this is on paper, the game, you still have to play the games, making it manageable on paper is a good decision, especially if your goal this season is to make the tournament. Mm-hmm. And and that's something interesting. I, I don't think we need to harp too too much on 2021, um, just in terms of like results, leave leave the past in the past, whatever. Um, 
But if you look at kind of where Tech finished, right, in in the tournament, ACC tournament picture, that they don't take all the teams, uh, for those who are less familiar, um, not all that comfortably in the tournament picture, um, but uh, a team that turned around and just absolutely whomped Syracuse, the team that finished immediately above them in the standings. Um, and and I, I promise I'm getting the point here. You talk, the, the point, uh, I'll stop bearing the lead. Point is, tough ACC schedule. And if you look at the games Tech didn't play last year, they finished 11 and 19 in conference, but they lost out on playing six games against North Carolina and Syracuse teams that were not good. North Carolina and Syracuse were the uh, team immediately above and below Tech in the standings. And in the one game they were able to play against Syracuse, it was not particularly compelling of a, or competitive uh, of a game in the ACC tournament. Um, I, I think maybe this Tech team, and granted they could have, they could have won some more games. They, they had a really icy skid, um, tough luck against NC State in, I believe, all three games or three of the four games in, mm-hmm, in, that, mm-hmm. uh, um, in that series. Lost a couple of uh, uh, layups, I guess you could call it. Um, Close ones to FSU last year, too. Yeah, I, I was going to say just they didn't even get to play the second and third game against Middle Tennessee. Um and combine that with losing. Actually, it was what they weren't three game series last year. That's what it was. They were um, all four. Yeah. So you lost four games against UNC and Syracuse and two against Middle Tennessee. All 10 of those are winnable. And I think we're looking at the season a little bit differently if Tech uh, doesn't draw Clemson in the second round of the ACC tournament. Uh, a, a Clemson team that was coming off of, you know, freshly rested, uh, pitching their pitching their ace. Um, and, and, you know, tech with, you know, maybe, maybe a closer to 500 record, at least it, it just, uh, being able to play those 10 games that didn't get played. Um, you look at this team again, pretty unlucky. Um, they come out of the gate winning five in a row and, and are ranked in some polls. Even, uh, they looked amazing, um, three straight run rule wins. Um, but that Florida state and Clemson, uh, back to back the, the Florida State 5-4 loss was brutal. Um, Clemson 5-3 and 5-4 losses, very tough as well. So, And then um, just kind of inexplicable losses to Miami of Ohio and Kansas State. Again, not to belabor the point. The point being, um, this is a team that was under, um, not underwhelming, that's probably a little bit harsh a way to put it, but... Um, underperforming? Underperforming, um, but also kind of, we're thrown straight into the fire with a, a brutal stretch in mid-March, right? So it, it's going to be that Florida State game. You can't let that control the next two weeks uh, of your season. Otherwise, okay. not going to come anywhere close to that tournament picture. Mm-hmm. So taking a look at that schedule again with some of the circumstances of last year, name your inflection point. Where you feel like if you take a gut check, if you take the temperature of the season, things are either going very well or very poorly or at least projected to go either way. You're going to hate me for this, but I am going to say the Louisville series. Um, we have to we have to add a disclaimer here. Jake's younger sister is a, uh, what, it's a freshman on the Louisville softball team. So yeah, that uh, is a disclaimer that we have to offer, but please continue. Yeah, no, um, my, Maddie is a, is a freshman on the Louisville team. Um, but uh that does give me particular insight into their program as well. Not going to say anything state secrety because I, I don't know any of those to be honest. Um, but it does mean I watch a fair bit of their uh, of their of their games. Um, and quite frankly, they're a team in a similar spot to us, right? Um, it, it's a team that has some level of tournament aspirations, um, it, it kind of rough equivalencies to uh, if we're drawing parallels. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through the projected lineup in just a bit. But um, like a, a Blake Nelliman type pitcher, a, um, a returning super senior Trisha Awald type, uh, you know, batting. And they're, they're putting all these pieces together, right? Tech, Tech 2 has young pieces that they're putting together, uh, trying to make that next step forward. And, and Louisville, just uh, I'm not going to spoil your uh, inflection point because we did talk about these earlier. But what Akshay can say about uh, 
his team is probably going to be similar where they are a quality team uh, looking to make that next step. Uh, and I think tech is very, very um, much so in a similar spot and just add it to the fact that it's, it's late March, mid, mid to late March, um, a, a month or so into the season, you're, you're going to want to know a thing or two about that team. And it's not so much, even as much a Louisville, like, Oh, you got to win or sweep the series kind of thing. Uh, I mean, you, you, a two out of three would, would mean a successful turning point, I think. Um, and you know, I haven't alluded to this yet, but uh, the old meatloaf two out of three ain't bad uh, will always apply. Um, but actually getting to the point here, coming off of Florida State at home and uh, Athens uh, in Athens, you're you're going to have to get off the map, right? It's a <laughs> get not. right. It's it's somewhat of a get right series, right? That's, Especially that's, considering the opponents that you're facing before, but it's not a get right series in that it's an easy opponent. It's a gut, it's more of a gut check, sort of get back on the horse and remain competitive kind yes. of series. It is a you need to win at least one game. Otherwise, you're looking at going seven straight losses. You know, that that's yeah, that's not good. That's not good. And and maybe pick pick up a Florida State win too. But yeah, Louisville is gonna be the turning point. And then you have a lot of season left after that to roll with. So I picked later in the year. I picked NC State, and that series is in the Ides of April. I it's in it's it's later in the year. It's less so. It's more in the middle part of the season, middle late part of the season. But it's the same story, right? I'm just sort of giving them a little, giving the team a little bit more leash to figure things out. It's where are you in your program build, right? During the season, how how good are you getting from the beginning of the season to the end of the season? And especially since it looks like this schedule, I mean, that's like the second to last ACC uh, series on the schedule. The last one is Clemson and then you play the ACC tournament. So that's when you decide, like that's when you sort of nail down, this is the team that we are headed into that final couple of weekends and headed into the ACC tournament this is what we are. Go- this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to make noise heading into the postseason. So when you're in that NC State series, that's when you want to be more l- looking very competitive, looking very dangerous, taking two out of three or even three out of three against a team that is equal or better quality, right? Like we've been talking about NC State and, and Louisville, so that you show proof of concept. And you show program growth heading into that Clemson series to end the season and then the ACC tournament. Because Clemson, if you write off, sure, fine, whatever. But so the NC State series would be where you're playing for seeding, basically. So you yeah. want to nail that down for the ACC tournament. That That's at least my uh, my side of things here. Yep. Um, I, I agree with all that. Oh, uh, one, thing to, one thing I did want to add, NC State, high-octane offense. We'll, we'll be interesting to see how that matches up with our pitching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk about the pitching then, since you gave me that uh, segue. Pitching for this program has been an issue. I don't think there's any way to put it better than that or more politely it has been a consistent issue it got better last season with the arrival of of Blake Nelliman she was a pretty nailed on she was a nailed on starter for the entire year and she put together some really good performances uh, as the first starter in the rotation but behind her it was inconsistent at best and you you sort of saw Tech still struggle to find that second that second person in the rotation and also a, a second person, second relief pitcher in a, in a, in out of the pen. Right. Yep. What, what do you see at the, uh, on the pitcher's mound? I guess it's not a mound in softball, but what do you see on the mound for tech this year? It, in the circle. It, in the what, circle. Look, I, I also had to prep for baseball, right? It's on my mind. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah. Th- Nelliman's first full uh, season. That's the thing about COVID. Really, it does weird stuff to, to eligibility. Oh, right. I forgot that she had 2020 as well. Oh, it's, it's like four games <laughs> um, that they got, they got in. Like t- they got like 
they got 13 or something in. See, that's the thing I always forget about 2020 is like the, the baseball team made it to conference play. Like that, that's wild. It doesn't feel like that happened. But yeah. um, in, in terms of in general, um, I mean, obviously, obviously you need to lock down that first, that first spot um, you know, Friday starter to use the college baseball term, the college starter role um, softball with, with pitchers just coming around a lot more. Uh, it's even more imperative, I think, to have a lockdown lights out ace. And, and Nelliman um, has shown flashes and like when the time is is necessary for for her to fill that role. Um, I think the the primo example would be her dominant performance um, in the ACC tournament last year uh, against Syracuse. Just they had absolutely no answer. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. for now, I believe it was no hitter, but this is me on the seat of my pants. No, I think it was a no hitter. Um, but yeah, so far ERA uh, 0.75 for her, um, but also worth noting. Um, and, and I think it would be great to see uh, Palmer Pinholster uh, take a step forward as well. Um, she only pitched 3.2, so three and two thirds innings uh, this weekend. So not a ton of action, uh, but two hits, uh, a walk, uh, four strikeouts, average against a, a, of a 167. Uh, Nelliman's average against was an 053. Again, both of those are are really great numbers to see. Uh, and then the Michigan junior transfer Chandler Dennis. Uh, we've talked in the past about using the uh, the the Nebraska volleyball school of evaluation to describe uh, the the, the Drunick transfer, I believe. Yep. Uh, and this is kind of a similar story, right? Michigan softball is an incredibly good program. Uh, they've been very well respected in the biz for a long time. Um, so, you know, maybe Dennis sees not enough playing time in there and, and comes down here, but, uh, so far, um, in 10 innings pitched nine hits, uh, kind of, kind of high there, but, um, has been able to, to strike out 11, uh, five walks, uh, two earned runs, three runs overall is, is really not a bad, um, yeah, not, not a bad, uh, spread and that's uh two starts as well so two wins and two start or one win sorry pinholster got the the fourth win pitcher but, wins are so dumb pitcher wins are, are so dumb. dumb you know it's it is what it is um i think uh it's also telling uh that tech has seen their opponents really stack runs in the fourth inning against um and, and that's kind of where uh the the dennis nelman difference i think is going to be because nelman is somebody you hope and think maybe you're going to get a lot of six, seven inning performances out of, uh, whereas Dennis, uh, pinholster, uh, Alexi Ray, I know, I, I think she was in, uh, for a little bit, uh, in one of the games, uh, that that's where it may be more of a tag team effort. So mm-hmm. got to get that second and third time through the lineup. Yeah, absolutely. I want to double back to Dennis real quick. I, she got a little bit of an early pull, on Saturday versus St. Joseph's. She had a rough third inning. Uh, she gave up two hits, a walk, and a fielder's choice. But she was able to sort of manage her way through and get out of the inning with just the one run allowed uh, and two strikeouts and then the out from the fielder's choice. So, you know, reasonable. It, 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 she was able to get out of it, but it just felt a little bit of a – felt like an early pull of just a little bit of a – a um, little bit of just, you know, we're going to use the arms that we have and cover the ground just to be safe rather than let our pitcher work through their issues, which honestly is kind of different from last year. Uh, I, I think Eileen was more prone to just leaving, leaving some pitchers in and saying, okay, they'll work it out. We'll, we'll take this a little bit slower, but you know, you're sort of operating on both extremes here now. Yeah. Um, also, just just taking a look at the and, and you do want to get the pitchers' time um, in right against these early games, right? St. Joe's and Villanova are not Florida State and Georgia. Like it's they're just not. Um, mm-hmm. So you want to get them in the circle up to the speed of the game, if you will. Um, Match and, fitness. And we can talk more about the actual results in a bit because uh, I, I think I have I have some more comments there. Um, but just in general, uh, the, the rotation that we've seen so far does seem that Dennis and, and Nellman are going to lead the way. And, and I think the 
the difference between being a ACC tournament team and an NCAA tournament team is going to be having that, that functional second pitcher. So um, hopefully development uh, and, and even improvement there will be, uh, will be the key, you know, grind the tape, see what it tells you and, uh, and come back. There is one other thing I wanted to note one second. Um, Kinsey Norton, uh, freshman, I think was the only pitcher that came to mind that we didn't see yet. So um, just a, another name to, to keep an eye out for there. But in general, very, very young team. Very young team. Yeah, it, it's a change. And it, this sort of segues right into our talk about the lineup. It's a change from previous years where the rotation and the lineup was loaded with seniors, right? Loaded with juniors and seniors. Uh, this is a very young team. I think the only senior on this in this lineup is Trisha Awald, and she's a super senior. She's a COVID senior. Zeitler, so, too, I think. Zeitler, Cowden was a transfer. Uh, Lexi Ray. Zeitler is a senior. Cowden is also oh, a senior. Pinholster. Wow, I did not do my research. Well, but it, but the point stands, right? They're all like, I, I think I counted it and there's like at least three spots that are new, if not more. And yeah. even if the, even if the players at certain spots have, are holdovers from last year, they're getting this weekend, they saw rotation with freshmen as well. So the overall point <laughs> is that even if I'm not wrong, if I, even if I'm wrong on some of the spots is that they are, uh, Eileen is toying with the lineup in places, right? She's introducing new blood and seeing what her most, powerful lineup most uh schematically sound tactically sound lineup is with some of these early season games yep i agree and, and i i think it uh even a, a casual perusal uh, of the stat sheet will tell you you know getting four pitchers in the mix mix is great uh but we actually had one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen uh players take plate appearances um so yeah y- you like to see that too Get them in the game, get them some at bats, uh, especially with the young team too. Uh, Awald and Kauf, um, Saleo, who's a sophomore, um, being uh, and Zeitler, of course, uh, and Cowden being the main returners. But other than that, uh, it's it's going to be pretty pretty new of an experience for somebody who maybe didn't tune in last year. Um, and even mm-hmm. then, uh, I think the only name I didn't list off as a returner, uh, or at least somebody who got a lot of playing time last year, is, is Mallory Black, who uh, and we can talk about the results from this weekend, but um, a, a lot of those returners did, did have great weekends for themselves too. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go through one of the sample lineups from this weekend. Calf uh, led off, followed by Awald, followed by Black. Sarah Beth Allen is a new addition this year. She played really well this weekend. Emma Mingini, also new, also had a really good bat early on this weekend. Kennedy Cowden followed her. Jin Saleo after her, uh, Bailey Zeitler, and then Ella Edgman, who is also new. Any thoughts on that, I guess, starting nine for it's, the week? It's tough uh, because there are um, there are a lot of things that I want to say that do kind of play more into a recap kind of format than a season preview, just in terms of the specific lineup. Uh, but in, in terms of... Uh, of those players, uh, of the ones you listed, uh, Kauf, Black, Saleo, uh, Mingini, uh, Allen, and Zeitler all had double-digit uh, plate appearances. Uh, Awald did have nine. So uh, essentially you can say that those are kind of your crystallized, I guess, uh, like seven-ish players who are who are probably going to get maybe the majority of your time. Um, yeah, uh, from Awald, Kauf, uh, Black, uh, Saleo, and Mingini, all of them hit above 350, uh, with uh, everyone but Mingini being above 450. Uh, those That is great offensive output. Obviously, it's unsustainable, uh, but you love seeing that it is spread out over a lot of places. Uh, I think uh, this is a team that can hit really well. Uh, Awald, uh, Kauf, um, in particular, led the way. And, and you know, Awald is somebody who's going to be uh, – hopefully breaking windows in O'Keefe uh, to, to use one of our favorite uh, little sayings there, but also, uh, you know, in, in terms of as a team, uh, including the the folks who got a couple at bats and, um, you know, maybe didn't have as many hits or anything like that. Um, but uh, in 103 at bats, 
you got uh, 39 hits for a nice 379 batting average uh, and also a 488 on base percentage. So a lot of walks in there too. What that tells me is we were probably due for a lot more runs, uh, just stringing them together in the right way um, seems to have been the key there. So uh, it does seem like there's some untapped potential even outside of, you know, the, the inherent four, five, 11, and eight uh, run scoring outputs. So definitely, definitely good to see there. And, and, and it does feel like there's there's a lot of potential for it to be a potent lineup. But as we've hashed out many times on this show before, it hasn't really been the lineup in the past that's been the issue. Mm-hmm. Just to round out other players that got appearances this weekend, Ariella Jackson appeared at pinch hitter and pitch runner. Uh, freshman Auburn Dupree appeared in left field. Madison Dobbins was a pinch runner. Caroline Davis, who was kind of this team's 10th woman last year, uh, appeared at first base. Sandra Beth Pritchett uh, subbed in for Calf at catcher. Uh, Grace Connolly was also a pinch runner. So, again, like I said, Morales was playing around with lineups, playing around with formations, tactics to use soccer parlance to see what, how she wanted to structure this team moving forward, uh, especially as you sort of, you have a lot of tough games coming up once ACC play starts. You don't get, you get some tune-up time here. You have Mercer coming up on Tuesday. We're recording this on Sunday. This will probably go up on Thursday. So you'll know the Mercer result by the time you hear this, but you have Mercer and then you have some of these early season tournaments, but you hit the ground running, like we said, with ACC play. So she's got to do all of her lineup tinkering now. Uh, we've talked through the lineup. We've talked through the rotation. If you had to pick a star, a standout person for this year, who would you say it would be? See, it's, it's interesting. I, I know we've talked a lot about pitching. Um, again, that's going to be the, how this team lives and dies this year. Um if it weren't so obvious to pick Nelliman as a star uh, in, in the truest sense of the, the term, the word, all of that, um, I would say Dennis, because I feel like she's going to be somebody who the season kind of rises and falls on. Um, but a lot of pressure for a transfer, huh? It, it is. It is. It, it's not a it's not a great thing to just get thrown into. But uh, independent of that, you got to say Nelliman. Like if if you can have one one option in, in this sport more than I think even than baseball, just because of the frequency of which pitchers are able to pitch and, and the, the length of time they're able to stay in games. Um, like if you can get one good performance out of Nellum in a weekend, and sometimes you're going to see it, see her twice, you know, Friday and Sunday. Uh, if you can get one good performance a weekend, you are doing leaps and bounds um, better just in terms of consistency locking in that one out of three because really and and i said it at the beginning and i'll say it again during baseball you can't expect to sweep every weekend and you shouldn't but if you can win two out of three games every weekend your tournament team you're if you're in the mlb it's the old adage of you win 60 you lose 60 it's what you do with the other 40 that matters going from averaging one out of three a weekend to two out of three a weekend is the difference between a good and a bad team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And spe- like you said, if she can lock down the beginning and the end of the series, yeah. you just kind of have to figure out the middle portion with Dennis or Ray or Penholzer and see where the cards cards yeah. lie. That's that's the thing about this conference too. Clemson and Duke are both good and new and whatever, but they're not invincible. The only team that's anywhere close to invincible on our schedule, ah, ironically, it's both Florida State and Georgia and we get them back to back. But Independent of that, like you can win two out of three against Louisville. That is doable. You can win two out of three against NC State. You can s- s- do whatever Syracuse, Pittsburgh, Virginia. Those are games you really got to be winning because you got to pick up the meat there. But uh, if you're competitive in those tougher series, the 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 I guess further up parts of of the uh, the ACC schedule, like then then you're getting then you're getting closer to to that kind that kind of meat and potatoes right you, you want to be in the mix with virginia tech Notre Dame, louisville nc state boom Th- that's where you're going to make the difference at the end of the mm-hmm. year i had a little bit of a different pick i went for Jin saleo and i think this kind of came up in our conversation as we were talking through these picks you need someone 
in that infield that stands out, right? You want you want to have another solid infielder that's both really good in the infield in terms of fielding and then also really good at the plate. Tech has had those historically, right? When we were at Tech, you had a bunch of really good infielders, a really solid middle infielder. And I think that, that, you know, they took a step back the last couple of years. But now Jin Saleo last year had a really good year, both uh, at the plate and in the infield. Now this this year, it's all about continuing that momentum, uh, limiting some of the mistakes that she had in, in the in the infield, and then also continuing to be a presence at the plate and also <laughs> putting together highlight real highlight real plays. Right. We saw a bunch on the NCAA softball Twitter account with just web gems. So if she can do these things, right, she can continue to hit consistently and then be a force uh, defensively uh, right in that Derek Jeter spot. That bodes really well for for Tech moving forward. Yeah, um, I I definitely think that's a great pick Um, that there's and there's we could have gone a bunch of different ways with this. Um, You know, obviously you have Calf who who could be an All-American this year, Awald, who's been lights out uh, at the plate there there's a lot of great options but um i i think with the amount of talent that they have coalescing it's it's a team that very well could take that step forward this year mm-hmm. so let's talk about that bottom line right have they figured out the problems the kinks that we've talked about in years past and m- mostly that comes down to our repeated discussions on pitching right do you feel like adding Dennis and adding some of the freshman pitchers that we have on staff. Now, do you feel like that closes the gap with the rest of the ACC? I think it can. I just don't know yet. Like, and and I I know that's a cop-out. They've played four games. Maybe we should know more. St. Joseph's and Villanova are not that good. They have not been tested in any significant way. Um, and, and a four one five two eight five are not exactly the most uh, convincing uh, uh, of scores. Obviously, eleven zero in five is exactly what you want to see, and wins are wins. Um, but I, I don't. I think the the verdict has got to be out there. I, I'm disappointed we didn't play the Marshall today. I, I think that would have been uh, great to see. Um, perhaps Nelman up again. Maybe the bats come alive. Um, sleeper picks. Um, obviously Mississippi state, uh, power five sec quality team, of course. Uh, but, uh, Southern Illinois, um, March or not March, uh, February 18th and 19th, um, as two of the other, uh, two of the other three games, uh, in Starkville this coming weekend, uh, are going to be pretty telling. Uh, I, I think Southern Illinois is a really quality program. Um, been familiar with them for years. I know. You may be wondering uh, if you are less familiar with the world of college softball, uh, why I, I'm in particular hung on hung up on this. But uh, as mid majors go, uh, very well respected uh, group. They've had some success in the past. A little bit of turnover there uh, in, in recent years, um, but uh, definitely a program with some pedigree. So, and that's why we keep you around to talk about mid and low majors from the Chicago land area. Yeah, yeah, you, you'll you'll love to see it, but. Um, in terms of the rest of the schedule, independent of that, up through up through really the start of, of conference play when we see Duke at the beginning of March, uh, there's a lot of a, a lot of games that tech can uh, hopefully take advantage of, right? You, you, you gotta mm-hmm. pile them up in, in tournament play here at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of tournament play. Is the minimum I, I, we we termed it as a minimum acceptable standard? Is the minimum acceptable standard for this team making the ACC tournament, or do you think that floor that floor that minimum is a little bit higher than that? It, it has to be at least a little bit higher. Uh, we made it last year, but by the skin of our teeth, uh, and we were playing on the opening weekend, which doesn't set you up for success, or not the opening weekend, the opening day, which doesn't set you up for success in the next round especially if you're turning around to play, you know, that, that number one seed or the number two seed next. Um, I think getting one of those middling seeds needs to be our minimum. Uh, and like we said, this team, uh, if everything really does break, right. 
Uh, and like, not that this is a, a guarantee by any means. It's, it's a team that has enough talent to make the tournament. It's just a matter of, of what that all shakes out in, in terms of. And that's being. the NCAA tournament. Yes. The, yes. Sorry. To, to fully be clear. The, the minimum, the minimum that we should be shooting for is like a, 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 a like five, six, seven seed in, in the ACC tournament, I think. Mm-hmm. So, a, so a middle of the middle of the road seed in the, in the ACC tournament. And then I think the way that we're trending here is the expectation for the season overall in terms of the postseason is that is making the NCAA tournament, right? I think that's the step that this team needs to take next in Eileen Morales' fifth year. It's it's kind of this, and I feel like we've been on the edge. Of, like there, there was a time when we were talking about these teams, right? And, and by these teams, I'm, I mean the women's basketball, volleyball, and softball were all kind of in that same spot. Now, granted, volleyball was a couple of years further along, having uh, been a little bit more established. But then at the same time, we were talking about women's basketball being in a similar spot with the previous coaching tenure. So time doesn't necessarily mean everything there. Time is fake. It's a matter of saying, Hey, volleyball is a team that's poised to make that next step. Um, There's a lot of potential, you know, all that same is true for basketball. You can see the pieces. They were successful in the WNIT uh, in 2017 and then 2018 had a pretty good run too. Uh, where's that expectation in 2019? Uh, and then again, the same softball, it was, Hey, the team's getting older. Um, pitching still a question. They do have that potential. I think like, it sounds a lot to be like, they got to start making the tournament at some point, but at some point they, 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 they do need to make that next step. And why not now? I think that's more of the question is you got to do it eventually. Why not now that they, they've got some talent, they've got a great pitcher. Um, they've got star talent. Um, web gems, highlight real plays. Like th- this team does ha- have that in, in folds, uh, but I think they were unlucky last year and, and they've, they've added some good depth for this year. So hopefully that makes some difference. Okay. All right. Pretty reasonable, pretty reasonable. Let's move on to the other side of the street and talk about baseball. Let's start off with talking about the schedule. They are still helmed by Danny Hall, as we all know, is I think in his 26th year, 27th year. I don't know. It's it's been more almost three decades. It's been a lot of years. I bring that up because if you look at the schedule and you do some mental maneuvering, it kind of looks like a bit of a farewell tour. That's just I'm I'm just saying you think about it a little bit, you ask some questions. That's kind of what it looks like. Podcasts are for rampant speculation. I've always we're not committing to anything. We're not breaking any news. This is where you're using our therapy words. I I think it might be a farewell tour. Yeah, um, with with an away game at Kent State. It at the end of the year, right before visiting Pitt you're kind of doing a tour of the Midwest right at the end there. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I, I actually will, will go check on this in the roster. So that way I don't openly speculate too openly. Colin Hall is my age, right? Yeah. I'm, I think he just had, he, he is, yeah, like, he's your age. I'm pretty sure. He's a, six, he's a sixth year senior. Like this has to be the lineup of Colin's out. After this year, you know, you have, what is it, 1,800? The older brother, the older guy, or the older Hall already left. I think he graduated two, at least two years ago. Yeah, yeah, he, he's been out for, for just a bit there. Um, I, I am going to pull up the, the media guide, but, you know, pot, I, I would, the thing that would shock me more if, if it were to be the, the last ride, and, and it does kind of look like that, Um with that, it wouldn't be more public. I, I feel like that you'd want to make a big deal about the most successful coach in program history hanging it up, which is why I'm on the fence about that being like, ah, yes, I'm certain. Because obviously, you you use your therapy words now. I I feel I feel that they would want to make it a a, a bigger deal. But um, again, we have no. Where close to um, 
solid insider information. It, this is us just looking at the schedule and going, hmm, maybe, um, as, as well as our fellow online folks' um, you know, uh, opinions and, opinions and yeah. thoughts. Yeah. I think the main thing on the schedule, aside from the, the farewell tour stuff, is it's not as competitive as years past on oh. paper. It is no. not that you're playing number three UCLA at home for a weekend. The, you're, you're scheduled to play a top, like a really good Ohio State team. I think that happened a couple of years ago. Um, like, it's not really close to that. It's a lot of Gardner Webb, Wright State, Pre- Presbyterian, those kinds of schools that are tuning in here. And I'm, that's not meant to disparage the mid and the low major. I'm just saying this is a program that we know that can handle playing the top five teams. And no, they're just the not on this schedule. <laughs> that's my question. Where, where did Auburn go? Also that there's no Auburn on the schedule. It's, yeah. it's a, it's, I, I called it in our shot sheet. I called it stinky. And like, I think that's apt. Even replacing the Atlanta challenge I get last year was COVID. But you replace the Atlanta Challenge, which usually has one or two Power Five teams with a three-game set against Wright State. What is that going to tell us about this team? It's not going to tell us anything. What happened to the return against UCLA? I thought that was a a home and home. Uh, also, it's Danny Hall's 29th season, by the way. Um, God, he's old. <laughs> he, he's, he, his other head coaching spot was was Kent State. Um, he did uh, mm. GA, GA and. Uh, and uh, go to uh, Miami of Ohio. Um, I and, think we uh, also so, play Miami of Ohio this year. Do we? I, maybe I'm scrolling. Hold on. Please, please continue talking. Uh, no, we do. Uh, not. We do not. Sorry. Yeah, Car- Carter's been done done at Tech for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, Danny's got Danny's got a lot of uh, great success uh, uh, on campus in the past. So as much as I, uh, you know enjoy a a good rampant speculation uh i i don't want danny to go anywhere because i do uh i do like that but um uh, we can we can save the rampant speculation uh about uh let's talk for let's talk about the schedule i'm dying to talk about the schedule personally it's stinky no auburn a lot of mid-major teams it's the same situation as softball but this team does not need the softball, like that, like the Kentucky schedule treatment. No, right? no. By using by using that schedule, it's gonna hurt you because the, the expectation for Georgia Tech is not to make the tournament. It's to it's host. To host. It's to host. And spoiler the alert for later, it's to host. The only Power Five team on the schedule that is not an ACC team. Is that university up the road uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, out, out in the boonies, uh, still in this state? We, we don't talk about them. But no, the, the only Power Five team that is not an ACC team on the schedule is the university in Athens. Not good. We're not it's, playing on the Again, it's stinky. Not good. Where, yeah, where is I think the, I, this, this is terrible. I hate being negative. I don't want stinky. to be negative. What it's stinky. What commending commending this team about scheduling so well in the past. It, it's just a shocking a shocking change. And like I get it on some level. I get it. Like maybe there's a, a different thing to be said. Rack up all these wins and then host or, or, or whatever that is. But like it's not as compelling to fans. It's not as compelling, presumably to to the tournament. Like to I I just don't get it. Um, I, I don't get it. And uh, I think the other thing that is almost irrelevant to a tournament and whatever kind of scheduling consideration is the fact that the third game against the university in Athens is not at truest. Oh, we've, we've talked about this before, but please give us the clip show version here. The, the fact that you traded in the single biggest spectacle in the sport, sorry, college world series. There's just as many people that go to the truest game. Um, to be played in a triple a stadium cuz like what what's the reason what's the reason so all, all no all the ticket sales from that in the past have gone to chill right like they still do they still do to be clear 
They still do, but they can only sell 8,000 or whatever thousand tickets versus up to 40,000 in a game that was attended by five figures, not high five figures. That sounds like 90,000, but you know what I mean? Like a, a very substantial portion of that lower deck at SunTrust. Um, uh, and the opportunity to play in a major league park is, is wildly different. Sorry. As nice as cool Ray field is it's, and again, that's not, it's a, not a major league ballpark. It's not a tech baseball thing. I'm, I'm sure they would love to play more in, in the major league park anyways, but whatever's going on there, I, I don't get why, why we can't get that one up. Either. So the short version, the short version of this is the, a couple years ago, I think this was before COVID happened in 20, they moved it to, uh, they had moved the game to Cool Ray because the turf wasn't ready after uh, the U.S. ski and snowboard team had done a whole ski jump thing there. So that was the that was the first movement. I don't remember what the excuse was in 21. I think it might have been some sort of spring training related turf management thing. It may just be that the, the, the turf management at SunTrust has been updated to um, to make or they, they do a turf replacement at that point during the year. And they don't want the field to stir. Obviously, we don't know if we're playing baseball, pro baseball at this point this year. So it's anyone's guess. They might just they might just move it to SunTrust in a couple of weeks if they know that there's not going to be tickets to sell in April. So we'll see about that. But that, like you said, that is the first week in March. That is the only Power Five team. It's not an ACC team that's on the schedule. That is followed pretty quickly by opening ACC play versus uh, Virginia Tech the following weekend. NC State comes, or we go to NC State in late March, and then you have this really nasty stretch in April on the schedule where you face FSU uh, to start the month, then go to UNC away, then face Duke at home, and then end the month. I think it's at Miami. Let me double check that real quick. It is actually Miami at home. So it's just a brutal... April stretch that's then bookended by going to Clemson on the first week of May. What is your inflection point for this season for baseball? Mm. Yeah, I'm going to stick with what I said before we started. Um, I, I think it's NC State away. Um, NC State's a high-powered offense traditionally. Um, how does that line up with our pitching? Wow, that's really similar to what I said for softball. I promise that I have some sort of uh, some sort of consistency here. He's original sometimes, I promise. Obviously, NC State, that whole College World Series narrative. Wow, I can't believe that was less than a year ago. That feels like a million years ago. Um, ACC tournament revenge game type thing, too. That was a whole dealio. A whole uh, thing. That, that whole loss was was, was a, ugh, tough. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, NC State's a great team, uh, and they have been in the past a great program. Um, I think we've seen great success in years that we've done well against them, and kind of similar to to how we framed the softball discussion. I do like that it's a little bit earlier in the year. Uh, I think that late March is when we should start learning about these teams and, and you know being able to kind of see those paths diverging. I think, to, to add to your point, I think – NC State in 2019 is where we sort of st- saw this team separate itself from the pack, right? They hit they hit really well that year versus NC State. They I think they swept them at, at home in our in, in, at uh, Russ Chandler, and that's when we saw we were like, okay, this team is for real. NC State was I think pretty highly ranked coming into that into that series. This team is for real. What is that? We start asking questions about, okay, where can they go? I can totally see that. I can totally see that being the same inflection point this year, the same, you know, narrative building point this year. I went with the double header of FSU UNC. I think you, if you get through that two week stretch at like four and two, maybe five and one, you are a, you are absolutely getting to the tournament scot-free pretty comfortably. You might be in line to win the Coastal at that point. Yeah, 
you're you're achieving some goals. You're t- ticking some boxes on on your season goals there, because those are two really good programs. I think UNC, uh, as so we've talked about, or not we've talked about, the, the baseball media has talked about. They have some issues to solve on the mound, but that lineup is still pretty formidable. And FSU is good as always. They're they're always uh, pretty solid. So if you can get through the, those two weeks with four and two, five and one, you're going. Your, your season is going really well. Yeah. Um, also, not to not to be that guy. I believe the the series you were talking about uh, in 2019 was the UNC, uh, not NC State. Um, last year's. Uh, tournament uh, or last year's series against NC state was um, was the sweep on the road. So um, I tried, you know, we totally prepared for this. Not to be pedantic, uh, but I think that's also valid to um, FSU, obviously um, a few years out now from their turnover. Also very interesting that we were able to keep uh, James Ramsey from, from a mama calling uh, situation with FSU. Um, But uh, I I agree. Uh, UNC's got some, shady pitching questions but who doesn't really in this conference um seems seems pretty uh, familiar if you will uh to to what we've uh what we've seen but yeah i i agree four and two and and that's a you know a, a solid thing to see as well but then again what do we have a meatloaf situation right <laughs> you're gonna keep coming back to the meatloaf situation aren't you no i mean the, what Joe Madden will always be the Cubs manager in my heart. So I, I, I go back to that. Okay. Well, you said you teed us up really good for a discussion on the rotation. You know, pitching situation at tech has always been a pain point for this team where I think I put it as I put it in our writer's room. Let me see if I can find it specifically. This team is going to live and die by pitching for like the infinity of the year. It is, it's, it's been a consistent issue, but when it works, like we saw in that 2018 uh, number three seed, every, everything goes right year, or it was 2019, 2018 or 2019, whichever the one was the really good year, everything crystallized, everything came together. They made a, they, they were a really good team. They were the third national seed, right? Yep. This is, it's, it's, they have the bats and we'll talk about them in a bit, but Talking about this rotation, there's no Andy Archer. He's he's grad transferred. Brant Herter, I think, has graduated. I didn't see him on the roster when I when I scrolled through uh, a couple hours ago. Uh, Danny Hall kind of gave us a preview of what this weekend will look like in terms of rotation. Chansoff is going to get a shot at, at one of the starting roles. Zach Maxwell is going to get a spot a shot at, with the other, and we'll talk about that a little, a little bit later. Uh, Court Rodig and Marquise Grissom Jr. They'll uh, duke it out for the three spot. And it looks like freshman, uh, I think his name is Adam Vinatieri. I want to make sure I get the name right. I don't want to mess him mess him up with Adam Vinatieri because that would be unfortunate. Fin, uh, Aiden, Aiden Vinatieri. I'm sorry. Aiden Vinatieri. Uh, he looks like the freshman standout uh, that might be getting the midweek role. That's all from Hall's last press conference, last preseason press conference this year so what are your thoughts on that sort of projected lineup at least for this coming weekend or projected rotation excuse me um like you already touched on the herder and archer thing um but uh to play my cards a little bit here in advance i would be delighted if zach maxwell um in the best shape of his life tm uh plus better command he's got some of the best speed on the planet in the i guess amateur level that's a you know outside of minors and majors if you compare that with control no one's going to be able to hit that right absolutely like i think zach maxwell becoming like an all-american all-acc player is exactly the kind of thing that like this team needs to be really great. But the, the difference is, and like we talked about with softball, like you can't Zach Maxwell, theoretically, your way to a college world series in the way mm-hmm. that Clemson or, or Oklahoma softball are going to be able to just, you know, 
r- ride their ace until they're glue, right? Like they're, they just mm-hmm. can't, it's not how baseball works. Um, yeah. Because of the, I mean, it's just literal, literal physical limitations, right? They just, you can't have Zach Maxwell throwing a hundred pitches in multiple starts per weekend that you can do it in softball, but it's impossible in, in baseball. So Huff or Rodig or Grissom are going to need to back him up. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think it's coincidence at all that in 2019, which was, I think by far and away, uh, the most top to bottom uh, uh, year of, of Georgia tech pitching that we've seen in, in recent memory, Tristan English, uh, Connor Thomas, uh, Xavion Curry, uh, and, and, and Brad Herter, who was yeah, solid before he, before he had to get Tommy John in the middle of the season. And who else got injured in the middle of the year? Zay Curry, right? You're, you're mm-hmm. looking at a situation where even with all that depth, it can only take you so far when you're like, oh, got to ride CT until he's done, so. And then you give up. A, that turned a, out well. Your own stadium. No. I have no regrets for how that game was called Mm -hmm. or the management. He was exactly who I wanted on the mound in that situation. Right. So you can only go so far with as many other questions as we have. I would love if all five of those guys became serviceable starters or, you know, have Rodig, maybe the the rotation is Huff, Maxwell, Grissom, Finitary in the midweek and Rodig being a really effective longer guy like that, uh, Mm -hmm. or Bart uh, being able to eat two or three innings at a time like that. That's what you need, right? Like that—that that is how you have a successful baseball team. And I don't think, um, again, this team was still a, a two seed in the tournament and a um, and the coastal winner, uh, ACC tournament semifinalist last year. Just despite not really having a service, I would trust their vulture for most of the year. And it sounds bad to say, but that's the reality, right? Yeah. Yeah. Luke Bartnicki might have been, and, and I, I was talking about this with someone uh, close to the team yesterday. Luke Bartnicki might have been the only, one of two at most serviceable pitchers on that staff. And you can only ride him out of the pen so many times before his arm falls off. And, but like you said, they parlay that into a coastal win, a, a an NCAA tournament berth, and a two seed. And they the only problem is that they went to Vandy. Yeah, they might have oh, anywhere else. They might have been fine, but they went to Vandy. Yeah, and even only- in Vandy, they only lo- they they lost that regional final. They lost the first game to Vandy, I think, really close because of pitching, and then they lost the regional final because it went to like sixteen innings and they ran out of arms. That was like a six hour long baseball game. God. But Ugh. it's also a testament to, to the fact that we have bats and we get into that in a sec. One more point I did want to say it is wild the consistency this team has had, despite how much turnover it has had. Because if you look at this list, we're, you know, freshmen from a 2019 team plus a COVID year still theoretically have, and it, you know, it's baseball people get drafted earlier, whatever, um, still would have some sort of uh, eligibility left. But if you look at our lineup and our pitching, the only names that pop out as having been around a really long time are the obvious Colin Hall. And then, you know, I guess Bart Nicky a little bit had some, had some appearances and then it's court roading. Like that's, that's it. This team just reloads every year. Uh, uh, and the fact that they're able to keep getting in all this talent, even if it's not working or not working as well as it could, they're developing and recruiting really good talent um, at the plate. And, and hopefully it, it translates to the mound as well. And, and I think, like we said, like that's going to be a big question for softball. It's going to be a big question for baseball. But um, there's a lot of common narratives with the stickball sports, aren't there? Yep. I, uh, I would agree. But um, uh, yeah, no. And then, after, I mean, with the bullpen, who knows? Like, I, I know that you hate this narrative that I'm about to toss out, but you got to think about it, too, in that our program went from having uh, a, a year going into last year, you know, COVID, obviously, and then a, a year of construction, forcing them to make do with some really sus uh, facilities type, type questions that we had um, in terms of, you know, 
pitching in the dead of winter outside with no fancy equipment, hitting uh, in the dead of winter outside in, in a, a really weirdly sloped cage. You know, like those aren't ideal training circumstances. And you went from that to, you know, uh, Danny Burrell's uh, madman pitching extravaganza. I, I, I mean that with love. Uh, I love that we have the best, most advanced facility in the country uh, to do that. Lots of technology. Hopefully it translates. <laughs> Question mark, mm-hmm. please. I beg of you. But um, <laughs> you went from about as unideal as, of a circumstance for training and winter development as you could have to maybe the best. Uh, so that that's something that gives me a lot of hope right there. Yep. Uh, just to round out the rest of the bullpen, uh, as you mentioned, Dalton Smith and Josiah Siegel were named as, as uh, pitchers uh, that were going to eat a lot of innings this year by Danny Hall. Luke Bartnicki also is in the best shape of his life, TM, according to Danny Hall. So look out for him as well. Uh, Sam Crawford, Cole McNamee, who's a uh, actually from my hometown, uh, and Joseph Manley also were named as relievers to watch. Uh, it looks like Jackson Finley, based on his Tommy John recovery schedule will be available late in the year if needed sort of around regional time. Like we saw Brent Herder come back a couple of years ago, expect, and this is from the horse's mouth. So I'm not really making anything up here. Expect a lot of arms to be tried out early in the year. This is sort of what Hall's strategy is. He has a bunch of freshman arms, a bunch of sort of upper, a bunch of freshman arms and a bunch of old arms as well to try out he's just going to let him cook and see what happens if he can. Uh, And we'll sort of see what the results of that are, because if you have so many pitchers on staff, you might as well use the weapons you have and see who separates themselves from the pack. Right. And, and how, and how they can become consistent contributors to a rotation that looks to be rebuilt on paper. Right. Yep. I agree. Uh, that's the bullpen always feels like it's full of surprises on some level too. So it's just a, it's the hat and you're wondering if you pull out a rabbit or a snake. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. You hissed into a microphone. Uh, let's move over to the lineup. Let's talk about performances at the plate. Uh, no Justin Henry, Henry Malloy this year, no uh, Austin Wilhite, and no Luke Waddell. You're basically talking about an entirely rebuilt middle and left infield in 2022. Uh, we do have one piece of that puzzle. Uh, newcomer Chandler Simpson. I think that's his name. I want to make sure I get his name right. Chandler Simpson, number one on the roster, will be at shortstop for Danny Hall. He was really, really good at UAB, especially at, at stealing bases. So look for that to happen. I think Danny said he would either be first or ninth in the lineup, depending on how things are structured. So look out for that. Just to round out some of the returners from last year, Kevin Parada at catcher. He's good. Not really much else to say there. Uh, Andrew Jenkins at first base. Uh, Drew Compton is projected to be at third base. Tres Gonzalez will be probably in left field. I think that's the last place in the lineup that I had on my list. Uh, Steven Reed will be DHing or in right field, and he'll swap that spot with Jake DeLeo, uh, who will be, you know, the other person in that spot. Colin Hall, we'll talk about in a minute, is probably penciled in at center field now that he's healthy again, recovering from that back injury. And I think if we, if I was reading the press conference, stuff right john anderson is being tapped to play second base so that should cover your entire lineup and and all the holes that are in your infield what do you make of that lineup what do you make of that defensive structure yeah i mean i i uh i will miss some of our 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 guys who are are departed of course um waddell being around a long time will height malloy um but but in, ter- in terms of the defensive structure, I, I don't think you can really ask for much better of, of an infield than having an all top 50 um, rated uh, bunch of players. Um, Cop did a third, uh, a great, great hitter. Um, saw a lot of uh, good sparks out of him uh, last year. Jenkins at first, as you note in our shot sheet, hot versus cold. Um, obviously, that's 
a, a very fair consideration, but um, also um, somebody who can really beat uh, the beat the cover off the ball a, a, as well. Um, would love to see uh, Anderson get time at second. But I think the main takeaway there uh, and the main emphasis you, you do want to have uh, is, is Simpson uh, at shortstop. Um, as you noted, again, to quote uh, a steel merchant, you know, that is. Oh, yeah. A different I want to pull up the number, actually. Playing, but in an exciting way, um, having to respect the steel. Um, if you go ahead and, and, and look that up, but having having to respect that uh, speed threat on the base paths, whether whether he's, uh, you know, um, a spark plug at nine uh, and getting the lineup turned over early or, uh, or at the one hole as well. Uh, I think either of those are really good and kind of plays into the, the Louisville brand of chaotic baseball, which, which I very much enjoy. So Simpson had 24 stolen bases in 54 games for UAB last year. Started, he played second base a lot for, for UAB last year. But even in the shortened 2020 season, in 14 games, he had eight stolen bases. So this guy, aggressive on the base pass. You will see him get a steal every couple of games. Even, he'll try it. Even if he gets caught, he will continue to try it, and he will play the numbers. So this is something that's really good. It's something that we kind of saw in that 2019 year where they got aggressive on the base pass. They took more walks at the plate, and they got aggressive here and there on the base pass. Bringing that sort of tension, bringing that, that, like you said, that component that pitchers have to watch out for on the base paths is really dangerous. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just makes them respect that more. And it's a table setting thing too, right? Getting yourself to second or third is a heck of a lot more powerful uh, than sticking at first. And, and this was a team that last year, um, you know, had a lot of innings with people on base, but uh, there were definitely games where uh, a little bit more uh, in terms of getting everyone around and in uh, could, could have helped them out a lot. So um, great to see. Absolutely. So talking about stars on this team, again, like we did with softball, who would you say needs to stand out for this team to have a successful year? Uh, Zach Maxwell. I alluded to it earlier. Um, again, getting to it. It's the definition of the Danny Burrell experience. He's got the talent. He's got the stuff. Um, he needs to put the command together. Uh, we, we saw um, Burrell, you know, uh, one thing that he's been able to pit, uh, uh, get installed in our pitchers is, is a lot of great speed. Um, if the command comes in too, then you're looking at a, a staff that can really develop it and put the pieces together well. Uh, and I think um, it, he has the potential to be a stud. Uh, it's just a matter of if or not it happens, if or when it happens. Mm -hmm. I think it's telling that both of us pick pitchers for this one. Because <laughs> I picked uh, Aiden Finitieri, whose name I got wrong earlier, and I apologize for that. But I picked I picked pitcher Aiden Finitieri. Reports from camp uh, and also from the horse's mouth himself say he's been really good versus the top line of Georgia Tech's lineup. So the likes of Kevin Parada. If he can keep that momentum up in the regular season versus the ACC level competition, that sets up really, really well for Tech defensively. You, like we were talking about earlier, you want if, if Zach Maxwell say he's at all he produces at All American level. Again, you can only ride the All American for so long. You need you need a two guy. If Finitieri can be that two guy, you're setting up really nicely, and then you. You can talk about adding a third guy. You can talk about adding depth out of the pen. There's options. Once, but you need to have one and you need to have two in order to get to three, four, and five, right? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I can't really add much more to it than that. So both of us pick pitchers for that segment, right? Going into our bottom line and talking about if they've solved their problems, how do you think that the addition of new pitchers, the first year, the first full off season of technology and um, some of the track man stuff and all that, and, and the Burrell spin rate analytics uh, Messiah kind of concepts. Do you think those two things will contribute to solving that issue in 2022? Or how well will they solve that issue? I uh, 
I don't know. It, I know that's a cop out. Cop out again. It, 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 I don't see why it could hurt, right? Like that you can't get, it, you can't get worse, <laughs> you know, add technology, add better facilities, add more time, uh, less COVID questions, Burrell just being around more, more of his guys, more uh, opportunity to learn his, his style. Um, again, can't hurt. Like it, <laughs> at the very least, um, I think uh, that there's definitely, Definitely good things that could be had there. Um, and I do want to say, um, you know, you don't want to get through this whole preview segment without at least touching on the fact that the reason that we're harping so much on pitching here, uh, the, the solving the problems thing, the stars, whatever, uh, is because we've been so consistent in developing and seeing success uh, from our position players at the plate. Um and being offensively effective. The fact that we went at the catcher position from Joey Bart to Kyle McCann to Kevin Parada is an embarrassment of riches Mm -hmm. at the very least. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, So again, we don't want to downplay the, the, the tremendous effect and success that that's seen uh, because that's been a, a great touch point to the success that we've already had. Um, there has not been a non-Georgia Tech Coastal Division winner since 2018. Like, this has been a good team. We don't want to sound like mm-hmm. there's all these horrible question marks and what's going to happen. It's just a matter of of finally meeting, I think, w- what you would say the, the fan base's expectations are, right? Mm-hmm. Or even their own, right? They, they know that they can go far uh, if things line up and it's a matter of making it line up. And I think th- this sort of leads into the conversation about what the minimum acceptable standard for this year is. But like you said earlier, this team with only two sort of reliable starting pitchers may was a two seed in the, in the tournament was and won the coastal last year. So what can they do with a full complement of arms, a full complement of reliable arms? It's, it's hard it's it's fun to predict, right? It, it's it's really fun to think about, but at the end of the day, the bar is is probably winning the coastal again and hosting a regional, right? We touched on it earlier. They have all the tools. It sucks to be saying that the bar is a, to be a top sixteen team in the nation, but at the same time, they have all the tools. They, it's an embarrassment of riches. A lot of other positions, they've been recruiting really well, so they need to do the thing. Right. They need to meet that level of expectation that we have every season. Right. Yep. Yeah. I I mean, it's time. Right. It's the macro scale. We've been blessed with past success version of it. They they haven't been out of a regional in in many, many, many years longer than the last time they went made it out of a regional was the the time they made it to the CWS. Yeah. Oh, six. Right. Oh, six. Yeah. Gosh. So that's the ceiling, right? That's the question of the ceiling. Can they advance? Obviously, that's a hard question to answer sitting in February because you don't know the seating. You don't know the rest of the field. You don't know who would be in that regional. But do they have enough talent? Do they have enough potential on this roster to advance for the first time since 06? Yep. <laughs> I, Easy I, one, I, huh? <laughs> I think they do. It's just a matter of getting lucky. A lot of this is luck and, and things lining up the right time. Injury luck. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. They've got the skill. I think injury got- luck. Injury luck is a really good point but because we talked about that 2019 season and you had two of your starting pitchers get hurt late in the year, in the midpoint of the year, and you had to co- you had to coast, right? Injury luck is a really good point. So all the pieces are there. I think that's the conclusion. All of the pieces are there for this team to make a tournament run. They just need to get through the regular season. And it, it, again, the pieces are there too and set them set themselves up for success in the tournament. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they definitely can. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all we have on the sheet. Do you have any other thoughts about, Baseball, softball, expectations, roster construction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am ready to get hurt again. <laughs> no, no. This, this is a team that could win the ACC. Um, 
it's a team that could explode. Like that, that's what you got. Um, one thing I do want to say, cause it doesn't fit neatly into anywhere else. Um, is that softball uh, has been averaging 350 a game so far, which is already a pretty strong tournament uh, or turnout. Sorry. Um, and I don't think it can be understated how, um, how good fan support uh, has positively affected, you know, basketball, men's and women's uh, and volleyball in the past. Uh, so if you're on the fence about it at all, um, you know, go, go out and check out a baseball game or a softball game or two. It's three bucks to get in the softball park. You they, can skip coffee for a day. They charge you for that now? They charge me. I don't know. I didn't walk. Okay. In my defense, I didn't walk through the front gate. Like I usually do. I actually paid for a ticket. I I was going to say, I thought it was free in the past, but maybe it's just because I'm a student. I was not uh, thinking, but anyways. Yeah. Well, I I, I don't know. um, It's three bucks. If you want to support the program, it's three bucks. (laughs) Maybe don't walk in the front gate. Uh, But yeah, the day are back in action. Like we said on Tuesday, February 15th at 5 PM at the Mew versus Mercer. That will be after, or I guess after we record this, but before the episode goes live. So you'll know the result of that one before we do. Uh, So the first game that you'll be able to see with this preview in tow is versus Central Arkansas. That one will be in Starkville at the Bulldog Kickoff Classic hosted by Mississippi State. That's an 11 p.m. tip, like I said, at Starkville. On the baseball side of things, they will kick off their season on Friday, February 18th. At 4 p.m. versus the right state that's at home, also on TV on ACC Network Extra. So packed weekend next weekend. Uh, Not really much more to say than that. Do you have anything else? No, I guess this is coming out in a weird order. So, uh, yeah, go watch. We're recording so much audio today. Um, But so much audio. um, Go go check out our recap stuff and and we'll be back on the flip side for, for talking about this weekend.